Hey guys, welcome to Finally Clicked, the podcast where we discuss business, leadership, and personal development. My name is Margaret Smith, and I'm the Director of Operations for Pickett Street Properties, a real estate team out of Bothell, Washington. And I'll be here every week with our owner and team leader, Jesse D. Moore. We'll be digging into concepts and ideas that have helped us both personally and professionally. And you'll also get a chance to hear from local and national experts that we know provide massive value to get to the point where it all finally clicks. Hello, everybody. This is Jesse Moore. Margaret Smith. Uh, Here with Finally Clicked, and we're pretty excited today uh, because we have a special guest. Mm -hmm. Margaret, who's our special guest? (laughs) It's Susan Scott of Fierce Conversations. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Uh, Susan changed my life, and I say this uh, unequivocally. Um, I was on a road trip to Montana. I was going to visit some family members that I was not um, having a successful relationship with. (laughs) And I had heard about this book called Fierce Conversations, and I thought, you know what? I need to have a fierce conversation with some of these people. And I thought I was going to get this book, and it was going to tell me, is going to give me, like, the confidence and the chutzpah <laughs> to, like, just unload on <laughs> on my family members, and, which I, th- <laughs> I felt was, you know, deserved. And I picked I got the book as I'm going on this road trip, and I'm in the mountains of Montana. I don't have any distractions as far as cell phone or, or work. And I read the introduction in the first chapter, and I closed the book, and then I... I think I emailed Margaret and I asked her to order copies for everybody on the team. Oh, I don't think I was here yet. And then I, <laughs> oh, you may not have been here. I, I asked my assistants at the time <laughs> to uh, order copies for everybody on the team. And then I went on on my road trip, on my journey. And um, what I found from reading just the introduction in the first chapter is that while I did need to have a fierce conversation with these people, the first conversation I needed to have was with myself. Mm. And that I hadn't been tr- totally tr- honest with myself. And yeah. there are aspects of it that I wasn't ready to have that conversation until I took some of the tools and resources you give us in this book mm-hmm. and kind of softened my approach mm-hmm. to the conversation. Mm-hmm. Which is so funny because the title, mm-hmm. and I was going to ask you this, do yeah. you think the title is a success or a failure? I, I love that question. <laughs> it is a total success. Okay. Be, so here's the thing. Um I I first heard the phrase fierce conversations years ago from David White, who's a poet from Yorkshire, England, and it, it the the term just woke me up. I mean, what is that? You know, right. what is that? It made me really curious. And then um, as I thought about it, I knew I wanted to have them. Well, the publisher sent me the contract, and a friend of mine who actually wrote he he was one of the people who wrote difficult conversations. I was asking him to take a look at this con- this um, contract because he teaches at Harvard and uh, negotiations. And he said, you have to write in there that you have total control over the title of the book. Hmm. They will want to change it. So I wrote that in there, and sure enough, they wanted to change it to powerful hmm. conversations, which would have pretty much guaranteed that nobody would ever have read it. <laughs> and so the reason I called it Fierce Conversations we was because I thought people would be as curious as I was. What the heck is a fierce, you know, at mm-hmm. least pick pick the book up or look look for some information about it to get an idea of what it is so that they would have an idea of what it is. Mm-hmm. And we have had some clients who said, we, I, we're not going to bring anything into our company called fierce something because blah, 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 blah. And I always say, wow, wow I think I hold your employees in much higher regard than you do, because it usually takes about 30 seconds to explain yeah. what a fierce conversation <laughs> is, take the curse off of the word. On a, from a That's marketing amazing. standpoint, I agree with you. It's a success. Yeah. Because, and I think it's awesome that it kind of um, requires curiosity. It kind of, yeah. like, uh, requires curiosity, the, the title itself. And then inside, the whole book is about staying in curiosity, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it is funny that the title itself kind of prepares you for a journey in in staying curious, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then Margaret, talk about your history with the book. and and Yeah, well, I was first introduced to it when I met with you for, I think, my final interview. 
And it was the end of a long process where there were several times where I I thought this was some sort of a cult I was joining (laughs) um, with Keller Williams. And then you said, okay, there's two books I need you to read before you start. Prior to starting, it's Fierce Conversations and Leadership and Self-Deception. And so I read through Fierce first. And uh, I didn't think much about the title. The title didn't, like, throw me. Um, But what I think moved me in the first chapter was I've always had a lot on my heart. Mm-hmm. Um, many, many words, many feelings uh, that I could not uh, bring out of my body. I could not express. I could not, for some reason, it would end up in frustration with crying. And uh, what this book has allowed me to do is it's opened up a path for me to speak my truth mm. and feelings and um, in a way where it takes a lot of the there's still emotion there, but a lot of the power away from whoever I haven't been able to speak to. Mm-hmm. And so it's just been uh, unbelievable. And I say, like I told you earlier, mm-hmm. I used it in my personal life and I've used it in my work life. And it's helped me talk to Jesse about things that are hard and uncomfortable and um, that used to always really be fearful. And so yeah, I'll be forever grateful for mm-hmm. the book and uh, the people that it's, it's deepened my relationships with. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah. That's so wonderful to hear, you know, and you, you both asked me, what did I want to talk about today? And, and it just, it just, what I want to talk about is exactly what you were just talking about, but you had a lot in your heart, a lot that you didn't feel that you could successfully disclose without ending up in tears or something going bad. And I, I just want to talk about being truthful, telling our truths, um, which is not an easy thing, and it's not it's not a simple thing either. It's complicated. Mm-hmm. But the, the simplest definition of a fierce conversation is one in which we come out from behind ourselves into our conversations and make them real. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, I, I recently read a book on Reese Witherspoon's mm-hmm. list of books to read, mm-hmm. uh, and it's a thriller. Uh, or a mystery called The Other Woman. And it is not literary fiction. (laughs) And the plot is pretty predictable, but I kind of slogged through it. And when I got to the end, I thought this whole plot, everything (laughs) that happens, happens because the central character, a young woman, will not say or ask what it is that she desperately wants and needs to ask of her husband, her, her, her brand new husband wow. and his mother. And so all of the all of the angst, all of the horror, all of the suffering, all of the tears, all of the anger, all of the fear, all of the everything, all of the juice is because <laughs> she won't say what she's really thinking and feeling. In fact, I don't know. I I would bet that about a fourth of the book is her uh, justifying to herself or to her sister or to a friend of hers yeah. why I absolutely I can't say this. I, I don't dare say that because if I say this and that could happen or they yeah. could feel or what could you know and the and I thought wow there is so much high drama on this planet whether it's mm-hmm. fiction or for real that is purely because we don't feel that we can say certain things and um, or ask certain things. Mm-hmm. And whether it's, you know, it's usually either because we've been taught there are certain things you just don't, you just don't say or mm-hmm. ask, or because we, we don't have the skill set, so we don't know how, because, and, and, when we tried it before, it went south in a heartbeat, and it was not pretty, and, you know, we still have Band-Aids all over us, and why would we want to do that mm-hmm. again? So it is a skill. But the thing is, the truth, well, let me just insert one really, really important point here. A fierce conversation can be having a really scary conversation, having a tough conversation with someone, but it can also be telling someone exactly, specifically what it is that we love about them. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying just, I love you, or instead at work saying, good job, saying instead, you know, I love the way you just did that with our children, or I love the way you 
handled the meeting this morning. I mean, people challenged you and you stayed so um, on point and you didn't get defensive and you didn't shut anybody down. You kept it open. I so admire that about you. And I wanted you to know that that's a fierce conversation. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's comments like that, a person on the receiving end can really let in because if you just say good job, yeah. My inside story might be, yeah, well, I, I don't think it was all that great, and mm -hmm. I don't know that you really mean it, and I, you know, mm -hmm. and then we go home and we wonder, well, what, what did he or she mean by good job? What part of my job is good? You know, so fierce conversations can be conversations of of recognition and appreciation and praise and love. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if it's a tough, if it's a tough conversation, if I need to talk with you um, about something difficult. Uh, you know, the truth, the truth can hurt, but it only hurts once. If I withhold my truth, it's going to hurt for a really long time and nothing is going to change. Mm -hmm. And in fact, things could even get worse to the point where we can't salvage this relationship because too much really muddy water has gone under the bridge. Because I remember doing some work somewhere, I can't even remember where it was, but afterwards I was doing sort of a fireside chat with a bunch of, of leaders, and this, and it, there were only about eight of them. And we were literally in front of a fireplace, which is one of my favorite places <laughs> to be in, in my life. And they were all saying, well, what about this? You know, I need, I have a... Uh, the, the the CEO of my company he he just sucks all the air out of the room and nobody else gets to have any ideas he just puts everybody down and he just domineers every meeting and I feel like we're not going to have any uh, innovative ideas um, or anybody even wanting to bother to try to do something different what should I say and I remember saying, how about you say that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> say that. And, you know, watch the color drain from the face. And one of the guy, the last guy was saying, well, my wife, my wife is so mean. She's just mean to our daughter. She's mean to me. She's just a mean woman. And I don't know that I can stay in this marriage. And what should I say to her? And I said, how about you say that? And he just stared at me and I said, well, or you could say, "What would you like to have for dinner tonight?" But that's not gonna, that's not gonna mm -hmm. resolve anything. Maybe you say, "I love you," and I don't love our life together. Maybe you say that, and you know, he he called me six months later and said, "I'm out of that marriage. I have never been so happy and relieved in my life." And thank you. So, telling the truth, I think most people I know honestly, spend so much energy trying not to say what they really want and need to say. Mm -hmm. I feel like the book, everybody needs to read the book. And at the same time, I almost feel like they have to be licensed first. <laughs> and when, it's like, so I kind of treat it like an assault weapon. Because, And here's what I mean by that. Oh, well, yeah. Is that if, if someone's not prepared and ready and aware... And I think that this book can get them there. So, but it is funny, you know, when I when you go through my history with this book, you know, I can go back to the first day I read it, and then I can go to the relationships that I introduced the book to thereafter, and how it promoted almost instant change in people, and it meant in some cases the dissolution of a relationship mm -hmm. or it meant a parting of ways mm -hmm. or and it's probably that was the fear that was manifested yeah. that was keeping them from having the conversation mm -hmm. in the first place mm -hmm. and what but at some point they become aware that the fear itself is worse than the actual act yeah right mm -hmm. that the fear of the unknown is keeping them from acting and then that inaction is making everything compoundly worse and taking you further down the road with it so that you're you know you're there are more consequences as time goes on for not having severed a relationship that needs severing or at least done your level best to to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and one of the things that we teach at Fierce is our most valuable currency is relationship. And it's 
uh, emotional um, currency, really. Um, people, there have been a lot of studies that won the Nobel Prize um, that prove that we we make decisions and act first for emotional reasons, second mm -hmm. for rational reasons. And so this emotion that we're so afraid of being in the room with this emotion, it's like Woody Allen, he said, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be in the room when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And I think that people feel that way about a conversation that could become emotional. Mm -hmm. You know, the other person might blow up or be or cry, or I mm -hmm. might blow up or cry. Mm -hmm. And it's just so scary. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, we actually need emotion to um, put the... That's what puts the gas on our yeah. tank to actually yeah. do something, to change. Um, I think that's what I've talked about most yeah. recently with some people is that... Because I do openly talk about being... I'm emotional. I'm, I'm vulnerable. Um, I talk a lot about how I feel. And that's my yeah. feelings were always something that my mom talked about yeah. um, growing up. But what I've been telling a lot of admins specifically is that it's because of those emotions that I get so fired up and I go off and I'll yeah. do something the next yeah. day that it gave yeah. me that courage, that energy, that uh, whatever, I, that vibration is coming to mind to go mm -hmm. and do the next thing. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes people feel like if they cut those emotions off, they'll be able to just get through their day. But actually, you're, you're probably missing out on a lot by not mm -hmm. using it as fuel. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. yeah. It is fuel. I mean, I, I think we, if we don't have a certain degree of passion in our lives. And I'm not talking about sex, although that can be lovely. Just passion, yeah. you know, passion. Passion for this relationship that seems to be sinking. Yeah. Uh, passion for a job that sometimes is really difficult and parts of which are, n are not a lot of fun. You know, passionate about being successful even though we've got difficult clients or coworkers who aren't pulling their weight or whatever. Just you have to care enough to want to do whatever it is that, that needs doing. Yeah. Well, I think this book is, I think the concepts are great for passionate people and for people that want to become passionate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a passionate person. <laughs> I can't help it, man. It's like, it's hardwired into my DNA. Yeah. And I think that's why I love this book so much is because uh, a passionate person without um, these tools is like a laser that's unfocused. A and bull in a china bull, shop. Yeah, yeah. A bull in a, yeah. Like, yeah. That's exactly right. Where yeah. I have yeah. all this emo emotion and I have all this Where energy. Where do I put it? How and, do I use it? And then I have the mental acuity that I just ke I can't get off yeah. of it. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at it from a thousand different angles. Yeah. Yeah. And then now now it's becoming something bigger and yeah. badder and yeah. worse that I can't control. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> You're right. So, you know, Fierce Conversations is, um, it is a skill set. Uh, and actually, it's a way of life. It's, it's, it's not something that you pull out just on special no, occasions. No. It's, it's a way of being. We, we yeah. actually describe it as the, this is the language of our team. Oh, that's like lovely. Like if you want, and so when people join our team, they get a copy of the book. And the, it's, uh, they are required to read it in the first 90 days. Because this is the language of our team. In mm -hmm. order to talk to us and communicate effectively, mm -hmm. you have to know the concepts of this book. Oh, that's wonderful. I mm -hmm. loved, I love hearing that. And, I, you know, the two of you, I, I don't say yes to a whole lot of interviews these days, but the two of you are, are two of my favorite people because you are so real. And you will talk about, this is what's going on for me. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm thinking and feeling. Mm -hmm. And it makes... The conversation is so much more interesting. Yeah, I agree. So much more interesting. And I think, you know, you mentioned, Jesse, you mentioned curiosity. And I think what stops conversations that could have gone someplace spectacular is because we don't, when somebody says, ooh, that, you know, that makes me nervous, we don't say, say more about that. Mm -hmm. What is making right. you nervous? You know, there's got to be a story there. Tell me the story. We don't. We just say, oh, and okay. Mm -hmm. And we move on to something else when there was something there that was just wanting to be explored. And, mm -hmm. we, and we don't do that. Mm -hmm. So one of the huge secrets, but that's not really a secret to Fierce Conversations, is ask questions. Yeah. As you guys know, our coaching conversation is a set of questions, and, and you give yourself a rule 
no declarative statements until I have asked all seven of these questions in order and have asked more questions in between that make sense to ask <laughs> because only then do you know am i am i actually are we are we talking about the real issue or some kind of mm-hmm. a symptom mm-hmm. of the real issue or what and um and all those questions include things like well you've said this is happening and this is happening and this is happening and this is happening when you look at those results what do you feel and when they say oh well, I'm, it's upsetting or i'm frustrated you don't just stop there you say talk about that mm-hmm. frustration tell me about that mm-hmm. say more that's where that is where the, magic, yeah. the gold is is in say more about that really wanting to hear you know we we we're adding some facilitators to our team. And both of you could, should come down and, and try out because I think you'd be great in oh, your spare time. You. In all oh, your I'd spare time. Right? <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, okay. Totally. <laughs> but so one of the one of the candidates um, is a just charming young man who teaches presentation skills. And the hardest thing for him, and he really, really struggled, even though we tried to prepare him, there's such a difference between presenting and mm. facilitating. Yeah. And a lot of people think that a fierce conversation is I'm going to go, it's like you were talking about early in your story, I'm going to go in and I'm going to let them have it. Yeah. You know, I'm, you know, I'm loaded for bear. There, I'm going to tell them exactly. And they think that's a fierce conversation. And it isn't. And it, that won't go well. <laughs> you know, that, that won't take you to any place worth going. Yeah. It's, it's about being real, but also um, you have to, you have to be, just as interested, in fact, ideally more, more interested in what is going on from where the other person sits, yeah. so that you can, you can, so that they quickly come to see. Okay, nobody's going to die here. This is not. Mm-hmm. I'm not being attacked. I'm not mm-hmm. being made wrong. I have a person sitting in front of me who's asking me questions that I don't have the courage to mm-hmm. answer but she won't let me off the hook <laughs> and so maybe I should try to answer these questions. So I have a question for you about this <laughs> yeah. question because this is actually one of the things I wrote down last night. So uh, I don't know where it started from or where I got it from but I've always been the person who asks the most questions yeah. and says the least yeah. about myself and so I wrote down your secret rule questions only. And I've done this and I recognize that in you when I first met you. And I think it's part of the reason I just hands down was like, oh, my God, I love her <laughs> because uh, you ask the good questions. And I like I take a lot of pride in making my questions the best they can be. Mm-hmm. And always when you're in, more interested in someone else in that conversation, I believe what you say, it's that all of a sudden they open up and then they become their best version of themselves mm-hmm. when they start truth telling and all of that. So I said or the question I wrote down was um, – one thing I have recognized and been told by some people is that uh, people don't get to know me because I do ask most of the questions. <laughs> most people, most humans are fine with that because they don't really care to know me. <laughs> um, does this happen with you? Yeah. And have you made a conscious effort to talk? I've had to make a conscious effort with certain people. They'll ask me finally, can you tell me something about yourself? Oh, yeah. Does that happen? Yeah, it does. It does happen. And I think it's it's not fair to only ask questions and never give anything of yourself never disclose yeah. anything of yourself so i think i think we do that but only when they ask and you can tell they're really asking mm-hmm. and like you said a lot of people aren't going to ask because you know they're quite happy talking about mm-hmm. themselves um and not knowing about you so the the big mistake that we make where we think well i i need to disclose something about myself here so that it's two-sided is yeah. as soon as they say well this is going on for me we think, oh, yeah, let me tell you, I've got the same thing going on, blah, 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 blah. And we have just taken the whole conversation away from them and made it all about ourselves. So we do that too early mm. in a conversation. Okay. But, you know, at the end, uh, or somewhere in there, they they can say, you know, well, have you ever, you know, have you ever dealt with something like this? Or, you know, what do you really think? Mm-hmm. And then you can say, I'm happy to tell you that. Since you're Susan Scott and you you wrote a book, <laughs> that sounds so funny. Yeah, I, I, I am Susan. I'll understand Scott. where I'm going. Okay. In a second. Since you're Susan Scott and you are the author, you know, of truth telling. Uh huh. Do you ever get to hide from the truth? I try to sometimes. Um, there are times when 
It, and and it, it goes back to something you said earlier, Jesse. It usually has to do with the truth about my part of it. Where is my DNA in this scenario that I'm not happy with? And that's where sometimes I find myself, you know, I, well, you know, I can't think of anything. But if I, if I really go deeper, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I can see my fingerprints on something. And um, so it, it's usually there. I'm not, I don't know why, but I guess, I guess it's because I've been having so-called scary conversations for so many decades now, and they are never really scary. Mm-hmm. They're never like well. people think they're going to be. <laughs> that doesn't scare me, but it's the self, you know, where, where am I in this? You're, what's so great about the conversations that are in the book, the models, yeah. is it does take the emotional charge mm-hmm. out of the conversation. And that's I think that's where the success is. Totally, yeah. And Margaret and I... I mean, we we use these models on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. I think it's funny when people read the book. I think that they want to go directly to the confrontation yes. conversation. Yes, totally. Like they want to go for the big guns, <laughs> yeah. the big birth. Yeah. Let me pull it As out. As a matter of fact, that's what our clients they'll say. Just we we just want to come in and learn how con- to confront. Oh and we always say we'll teach you that. And first, <laughs> there's yeah. some there is some. Uh, foundational understanding. We yeah, I mean, I, the beach ball conversation is such a great, you know, uh, conversation just to get people yeah. uh, aware of perspective and everything else. And then I think mineral rights is probably yeah. the one a great that one. that's the one you should be doing more often. Yeah. Well, don't you think people are results driven, right? We all want the instant, instant gratification. Right. Let's just get that change to happen right away. Let's just confront this. And, yeah, uh, and the change means you doing something yes. different. <laughs> and yeah. not not to take away that model works. That I've used one. that I've used that conversation model, the confrontation uh, model, and it's amazing. It has turned hearts around that I didn't think could be turned. Mm-hmm. Like I I did it as kind of a last ditch effort to say I want to I want to say I tried. I did everything possible to make this work. And so I'll do that confrontation model, and I'll I I've been across from people and seen their heart change right in mm, front of me, mm. and it's amazing. And sometimes it's our hearts you know, that change. Um, where we were thinking a certain thing, I'll give you an example. Um, I I my publisher said, let's celebrate 15 years of your book. Let's let's do a let's reissue it and put some new stuff in there. So I put a whole section on feedback and some other things, and then feedback now is one of our most popular courses, and the and the here's the big here's the secret in that the thing that totally changes feedback into something wonderful because usually if somebody comes up to us and says I have some feedback for you it's like oh god you know what fresh <laughs> hell is this you know what did I do this time um, but here here would be an here would be an example of. Um, um, you know, you're in a meet. You're you're sitting in a meeting. Maybe you're the boss, and but somebody is leading the meeting, and um, and somebody else holds up their hand. And this person leading the meeting, let's call him Bob. He keeps ignoring her, and you know she's held up her hand a couple of times. He keeps ignoring her, and so it would be easy to think this is this just you know what's wrong with you and beach ball. You know, we everybody everybody speaks, and it would be easy to go up and say afterwards, you know, why in the world? I mean, what what was wrong with you? You know we don't do that. You know we want to blah, 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 right? But instead, if you said, hey, Bob, in the meeting, I, you know, Jan held her hand up like three times, and you never called on her. Could you tell me what was going on? Just that. Stop. Full stop. And then he might say, oh, no, oh, I didn't even notice as you know, we've got a newborn in the house. I haven't gotten any sleep. I am just running on fumes. I love Jan and I love her ideas. I'm going to go apologize to her right away. And I had a funny one that really happened to me, not at Fierce, but where I was before. Um, I walked past somebody who was on the phone with a customer and yelling, yelling, yelling into the phone. Hmm. And um, it would have been really easy to yank that person into the office and say, what the hell is wrong with you? You know, we don't yell at customers. But I said, "You're, I heard you yelling. I'm assuming it was a customer. Can you tell me what was going on? And, and he said, yes. Oh, God bless her. That customer is almost totally deaf. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> and she keeps saying, 
I can't hear you. Talk louder. And she said, it's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. I know. And, and, and now we're both laughing, you know. And in the other situation with the meeting, now we're both commiserating what it's like to have a newborn. Yeah. And apology. An apology is imminent. I mean, these are things that we make up stories, and then we behave as if our stories are true. And nine times out of ten, they are not. Yeah. But we go in with our story loaded for bear. This is what this is what you said, and this is what that meant, and this is where you were coming from, and this is blah. And no wonder it doesn't go well. So, fierce conversations is about hey, hang on. Why don't you just ask a question? Can you tell me what was going? This is what I saw or heard. Can you tell me what was going on? Mm-hmm. And and wait for it. And if whatever they say, you might even say say more. Tell me more about that. What else? And just see, because now we don't we don't need to have that conversation that I thought I was going to have. Yeah, it's a totally different one. Yeah, or no conversation at all because it it's a moot point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's stay on the feedback uh, train for a second. All right. It doesn't surprise me at all that that's uh, a new <laughs> s- successful area for you guys because it feel I feel I'm a feedback junkie. <laughs> I love feedback. In fact. Uh, when we hire new people, we have um, how you win with us statements and how you lose with us statements. And, mm. and feedback is an important part of winning with me. Not providing me feedback is a way to lose with me. Yeah. And so I feel like I'm good at course at correction. I'm, I feel like I'm good at, at um, minor adjustments, you know, to be a better person. And so that's why I kind of hunger for it. I kind of want to know. I also know I'm not that objective, Right. And so join the crowd. <laughs> and then if you're talking to CEOs and sales teams, like I have to think that for a lot of um, personality types, you know, that feedback is fuel for mm-hmm. some people. If you're an extrovert or a narcissist or <laughs> or if you're just in sales and you want to feel like you're doing a good job, that feedback has is essential. So I think that you, the fact that you guys are focused on that you know, it makes a lot of sense to me. Well, it's funny because in my naivete, I didn't write about feedback in the first edition of the book because I thought, well, that's easy, you know. And come to find out, it, it isn't. Mm. And it's there's not a lot of it going around. And a lot of, a lot of people exist in a feedback-free zone. Mm-hmm. So there isn't a lot of development. In the, but one of the most important things is if you're the boss um, of anybody, um, it's the rare direct report report who is going to come up and give you feedback. So you really have to ask for it. So true. And it's yeah. not enough to say, do you have any feedback for me? You have yeah. to say, you know, you were in the room. We had the meeting this morning. Um, I always want to know if I could have done something differently or sped up or slowed down or anything at all. Did you notice in the meeting? Because I would, I would really welcome your feedback. So you have to be really specific well, and yeah. ask for it. Yeah. And if they you know, look like the deer in the headlights, <laughs> this is a trick. This is a test. I'm going to be shy. <laughs> you just have to hang in there with them and say, no, really, it's okay. Yeah. Tell me, was there yeah. something you wish I had done differently or yeah. might have improved the, the meeting for all of us? Mm-hmm. And, and then when they tell you, say, thank you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know that took guts. Thank you. And I love what you were saying, Jesse, about... One way you you win with me is to give me feedback. Mm-hmm. I I don't think I have ever heard a leader say that, and I think it's so powerful. So I'm going to steal it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Do it. I'll give you credit. <laughs> I'll give you credit. But I think that's just so so wise. Well, I, I think know. it's uh, the other part about feedback that I think is important that we have to deal with is um, feedback to our. Uh, Employees, mm-hmm. And so um, I was looking for a quote. I wasn't able to find it. But there was this article I read in um, Fast Company. And it, somebody did a study on performance reviews. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. essentially what they found is that um, the worst thing you could do is do an annual mm-hmm. or biannual yep. performance review. Yep. Because it was tantamount to dropping bombs yep. on people. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and like the sense of anxiety and worry and concern. Because it had been so long between feedback sessions, they you automatically go towards the worst or mm-hmm. you assume the worst. Plus, you don't even remember what, mm-hmm. what might have happened that would have caused this. So that's the other big um, new section in the rewrite of the book. And 
I'm, I'm happy to say that I think because of my second book, which is Fierce Leadership, the first chapter, and, and the subtitle is um, A Bold Alternative to the Worst mm-hmm. Best Practices <laughs> of Business Today. And the first one is 360-degree anonymous feedback. Yeah. So 360 is great. Anonymous sucks yeah. big time. Yeah. And, and so I, I'm really happy, and, and the whole chapter is about feedback and and, and why it needs to be face-to-face, mm-hmm. if possible, 365 days a year so yeah. that you stay current with people. And you never, you know, if you do that, you usually don't end up having to ever confront because you, mm-hmm. you're current. Nothing ever builds up. So true. And I think yeah. it's one of the, I'm hoping that my book was one of the contributors to the sea change in performance reviews. More and more companies are ditching the uh, anonymity mm-hmm. um, that is so toxic. It, it is one of the most toxic things you can ever put in your company is anonymity. Huh. Um, it's, yeah. What so, is uh, Fierce's, um, what is your performance review look like? Is it, and what's the, how does it laid out? Well, we, obviously we, we work very hard to practice what we teach uh, and uh, so we, all of our people have been through our feedback training themselves, and all of them have read both of the books. And so we do stay current. I mean, when there is um, usually a quarterly sit down um, of a direct report with the person they report to, there are never any surprises, right? Because well. they're so they're so current. It's it's usually more like how's it, um, you know. He, Looking at looking at your stats, or looking at your report, or looking at your results, it seems to me you've you've made some shifts that are really yeah, working better. Yeah, you're working. I mean, I, I'm liking what I'm seeing here. Tell me how it's going for you. You don't want to start that conversation with how do you think it's going. That's a horrible <laughs> thing to ask As anybody. Passive aggressive way. To oh yeah, I mean the person will have a mild heart attack right then and there <laughs> because they're thinking. Uh, it's probably not going good, according to this person. You know, it's just a, that's just not that's not a grown up adult, fair, mm-hmm. honest thing to ask. You just say, let's talk about where you where you've been, where you are, where you want to go next. Anything? What's working for you? Anything in your way? Something you need you don't have? That's something we really encourage. Yeah. Uh, in relationships between rainmakers and their admin, is that. You meet on a weekly basis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you meet on a weekly basis because if you meet on a weekly basis and you're making small adjustments yeah. and you're making mm-hmm. goals and you're tracking those goals yeah. and you're tracking the momentum towards yes. those goals, mm-hmm. yeah. then all that emotion then is unpacked because it's just mm-hmm. yeah on the schedule. Yeah. That's right. And it's a regular conversation. It's and not that's... building up to some yeah. grand finale. I was going to say, I think uh, around feedback and all of these, the weekly meetings that we talk about, what I'm still finding though is by far, I would say, I could easily say 80% of the people I talk to, they don't get those weekly meetings because their leader doesn't want to do the work. Mm. And so recently someone asked me, how do you pour into Sarah, who's my direct report, who's our team admin in TC? How, do you, um, how are you teaching Sarah about leadership? How are you pouring into her? And I said, well, no matter what, no matter what I meet with her every week for an hour. Mm. I might be, it might be the busiest time mm-hmm. at Pickett Street. It might be the craziest time. Mm-hmm. I might have a thousand other things I have to do. Mm-hmm. I set them all aside. I put my phone away. I put my chair over next to her desk, and mm-hmm. I sit there, and I look at her, <laughs> and I ask her all the questions that and I the can first think of. Question, the first question, if you're doing mineral rights, which... Our, our leaders do quarterly, uh, not weekly, but quarterly, oh. is what, you know, given everything that is going on for you, given everything that's on your plate, everything, what is the most important thing we should be talking about? And so it, it's from, from the fierce perspective, because you're doing that fairly often, guess, who's, guess who set the agenda? It's the, the direct report. You know, you're not having to um, come up with with this huge agenda mm-hmm. and do a lot of prep That's for it. True. You certainly need yes. to know their results. You certainly need to know what's going on. Mm-hmm. But uh, in the mineral rights conversation, they're the ones that say, "Well, it's this," because it, it's really easy. And I made this mistake early on in my coaching, and I, I never even really think of it as coaching. I always just thought of myself as a friend who shows up from time to time to whom you can say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to make the mistake of 
I would take all these notes, and then I would the next meeting I'd follow up with them. Well, what mm. happened here? What happened there? How'd this go? What the and only f- find out at the very end that something <laughs> is on their plate that I didn't know about that is really big. And now time's up. Got to move. Got to go have a meeting. You know. So that's why I I really and a lot of huge corporations are doing this now. The employee says, "Here's what I want to talk about in their in their formal performance reviews, hmm. here's what I want to talk about. And it's not that the, their leader won't have anything else that they also might want to talk about, but the employee is driving the, the meeting, which mm-hmm. I think is just brilliant. Mm-hmm. I don't uh, – I'm going to talk about something I know nothing about probably, um, but my fiancé is a um, nurse, and it, as a business person – how healthcare <laughs> runs it just drives me absolutely crazy. Mm-hmm. And I just, I'm thinking about what you're just talking about, where the feedback comes from the employees. Mm-hmm. And I look at something like the healthcare industry, where that would have just such a mm-hmm. crazy impact. Mm-hmm. Because all I, what, what I like consistently hear from, um, my fiance and her peers is like nothing makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know, everything's mm-hmm. handed down mm-hmm. doesn't make sense in the field mm-hmm. because they're not taking into account the landscape or the atmosphere or the mm-hmm. emotion or the people or anything. It's just mandated down. Mm-hmm. And so I can just see it now. And that's been a lesson to me too is like rather than me exerting my vision on everybody is having a cohesive conversation that kind of brings everybody's visions together and you can build it from there. Um, I'm really curious about the healthcare industry and how they're going to dig themselves out of this. Well, one of our largest clients is a very large healthcare organization and they are making, I mean, they are, they're getting a lot of attention. Um, They're uh, good, good attention. And, you know, their employees are very, very happy because they are, Asking and listening um, to all parts of the organization, you, and their meetings aren't just always the, the usual suspects in the room. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like who else? Given given this topic, who else needs to be here? Who else do we need to hear from? And it might be that one of the newest employees on the mm-hmm. block, but who's mm-hmm. who's worked here for thirty days and might have right. discovered something. And then <clears throat> I went in for a, um, a meeting with them. A physician um, that I had never met um, about a year ago, and he happened to ask me what I did. And I said, well, I wrote this book called Fierce Conversations. And he said, oh, hang on. And he left, and he came back holding the book. Wow. And he said, <clears throat> I've read this. Everybody that I work with, my nurses, everybody all have read this book. We love this book. This is real. And I was just stunned. I was just so glad. And um, (laughs) and then the other day I I went in for a bone density scan, and this guy says, "I remember you. You saved my life." And I said, "What?" (laughs) (laughs) And he said, "Yeah, didn't you write Fierce Cover?" And it's like he he had he was headed in a not so good direction uh, with relationships, and um, it's like so it's out there here and there Mm -hmm. and. I agree with you. you. Where I'd most like to get fierce conversations is into Congress, the House of Representatives. Yeah, I know. So it's a little not going to work right now, I don't think. Yeah. Well, I, I, one of the, and I don't know if we get, or we're allowed to talk about this or not, so you'll just have to tell me. But, I mean, weren't you working on putting fierce into the school systems? Well, yes, and, and, and I, after... 14 years of, of a, t- a team of people taking it to schools, what was happening was the principals and the superintendents and the faculty and the staff were loving it, but they weren't taking it into the classrooms, hmm. which I finally said, I'm sorry, but you can't have it anymore. It's like if I, if I had a, a cure for cancer and I'm only going to share it with certain people but not you um, – that just would be all wrong. So I shut the whole thing down. I said, we're just not going to do that anymore, except for on Orcas Island, where I spent some time, and you guys have visited me there. Um, I met with the superintendent there, and I said, I'm going to make you an offer you cannot refuse. And 
I will teach, you know, we will teach you and your, wow. anybody you want to, if you'll take this into your classrooms. Well, they're doing that. And they're starting, they're doing it in their elementary school right now. And then they're going to bring amazing. it into their. Well, that, to me, that's how we get it into Congress. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Now you're now you are talking about right. systemic change on a late. massive <laughs> level. Like you've started a ripple. And I was just, because yeah. it reminds me, so I worked at the Veterans Hospital ah. um, for about a year when I was an intern. And you, when you get into the inside of those yes, massive yes. bureaucratic organizations, I mean, we kind of have to start outside like this in business and schools and nonprofits and all these, and then it that's seeps right. in. That's because right. that, those places, I mean, there was so much red tape there. Mm-hmm. You can, I couldn't, that's part of the reason I got out mm-hmm. of social work is because mm-hmm. I didn't think I could make change happen on a mm-hmm. massive scale. Mm-hmm. So I think it's happening. It's seeping and you're seeing it. The when younger ones are coming in. Yeah. I mean, talking with, with most of seasoned politicians is like, Trying to nail Jello to the wall, you know, you can't. Yeah. There's nothing there, and they keep saying the same nothing over and over and yeah. over again. And there's just, no. yeah. yeah. But so I think it is the younger ones that are going to come in and say enough, enough, enough. Just like the students have said enough with this conversations about gun control. Gun and- control, you know. We just watched our our friends die, and um, we're just tired of it. I mean, I. And I thank goodness for the the younger ones coming up and into all of the roles that are so, so important. Because the people that, I mean, there are some great people in government right now, but a lot of them are so, so afraid, so wanting to protect their own jobs. Yeah. They'll say whatever just to not get thrown out or to lose votes or whatever. And boy, they're putting their own personal agenda way ahead of the common mm-hmm. good. And, um, and of course, yeah, we have a president who couldn't tell the truth if his life depended on it. <laughs> Depends on the day and the, <laughs> what he's trying to say. And it, that's the funniest part to me is when they see I, – I love it when they pull up an old tweet that he did like six years ago yeah. and then a new tweet and how they totally yeah, contradict yeah, each other because yeah. – it didn't serve him. Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't say that Mexico was going to pay for the wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, Margaret, I want you to identify a question from our audience that we want to mm-hmm. touch on. And then while you do that, uh, real quick, I'll just say this, that uh, Susan mentioned that um, running into people that have copies of her books or even have cases of copies of her books. <laughs> oh, and, yeah. and I just have to say, if you haven't read this, if you haven't read anything by Susan Scott, I encourage you to do so. I've recommended it to friends, and I have one friend that is more of an acquaintance. I barely know him, to be honest, and um, uh, he was in between jobs and kind of lost, and or he was maybe at a job and he just didn't like it, and so I recommended the book to him, and to this day, that was probably uh, 2011, so, you know, eight years ago, and to this day, he always carries a case of Fierce conversations wow. in the trunk of his car. Wow! And any time, I mean, he hands them out weekly. Yeah. So, oh. so I just have to say, to me, um, I was talking to Margaret this morning about how it's a little bit like a Bible to me in the <laughs> sense that, in good to great, they say that mastery is an asymptote, that we always move closer to the axis, but we never touch it. Right? We never achieve Wait, true it, mastery. mastery is, a, is, is a what? An asymptote. What is that? It's a mathematical <laughs> term for. <laughs> An arching line that curves ever closer to the axis okay. point, but never touches it. Okay. So our our ability, our tra- <laughs> our journey towards mastery right. is getting incrementally better right. each and every time. Yep. Mm-hmm. But we'll never achieve right. total mm-hmm. mastery. Right. Right. That's, that's right. And so when I think about this book and the concepts in the book, I was thinking back to when we were in it like every day, and mm-hmm. it was a big part, and how great the culture was, and we mm-hmm. had low turnover. And there were still conversations we missed. Mm -hmm. Like, as we talked about it. Mm -hmm. Like, even when we did this the best, Mm -hmm. there's still some conversations that slipped through and blew up our entire organization. And it's just so, it's just, to me, it acknowledged, I just have to focus on this. To me, I have to focus on this every day. Mm -hmm. Like, I have to, I I drove in today listening to your audiobook and just Mm -hmm. reminding myself of everything that I know, but I need to water it. Mm-hmm. You know, I need new sprouts mm-hmm. to come up mm-hmm. so that I can mm-hmm. aff- affect change in my mm-hmm. life today. It makes me think of, well, you, you know Jim Sorensen. Mm-hmm. He's one of our favorite facilitators, and he talks about admiring, standing with one of his friends, looking at his neighbor's yard, 
and saying, my gosh, you know, her yard is so beautiful. I wish I had her yard. And Jim's <laughs> friend said, well, Jim, um, she she does something to her yard <laughs> that you don't do. <laughs> when she sees a weed, she actually pulls it. <laughs> because I can tell you right now, if you had her yard in about a month, it would Look it would like look like yours. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it is about it's about trying to be aware and obeying our instincts. Here's I think I need to talk with mm-hmm. this person, or I think I need to check on this, or ask, or I think I need to have a conversation with myself. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of meditation apps out there, which mm-hmm. is so wonderful. And I I think anybody who's meditating, it should end with, is there a message? for me, from me, or from the higher good or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, is there a message for me? Uh, as I've been doing that for years, and there very often is. Um, yeah, you need to X. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a totally random pop culture reference. I just mm-hmm. watched a really bizarre movie called Eighth, Eighth Grade. I think is what it's called. <laughs> and uh, and it's bizarre, and it, I, I don't recommend it because I have anxiety, and, and if you want a full dose of anxiety, watch a movie about being in eighth grade. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but there's a part of the movie that's really uh, cute and kind of genius, and, this, and the protagonist writes a letter to herself in the future. Mm-hmm. And it's a letter of encouragement. Yeah. And so she starts out eighth grade by writing herself a letter mm-hmm. yep. as an eighth grade graduate. And then as a high school graduate, yeah. and it was just so such a neat yeah. concept yeah. to give yourself permission to yeah. be like to like herald yourself, yes, to like to push yourself up, yeah. in I the love, future. I've so. loved that, and I remember I did that years and years ago. It, somebody instructed me to do it, and it was really useful. Yeah, I love yeah. that idea. I'm going to yeah. do it. I'm going to yeah. do a good letter to myself. <laughs> We've done that before in our in our retreats. I yeah. understand, like the yeah. year I do a letter. F- to yourself a year from now mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you know what does your year mm-hmm. look like mm-hmm. I think what I think is different than about this one is I think that type of exercise is more about goal setting and visualization mm-hmm. as getting what you want mm-hmm. or intention versus even in this this point was very more emotionally supportive more like stick it in the ground and open it up 20 years later like even, if, <laughs> even if you don't even if people didn't like you I, I believe in you and <laughs> And, you know, <laughs> it gets better, that type of thing. <laughs> that sounds like fun. I get, I get a tragic hole sometimes. I need to dig my way out. So. What you got, Mo? Um, so we have a couple of questions. One of them is from Elizabeth Grace Marty, who's out of Nevada. She's darling. She's an, an agent, and she's always listening. And she said, uh, I would love to know if she's had repercussions with fierce conversations and if there were any memorable enough to change her thinking or her mindset and how that change has served her going forward. There have definitely been repercussions, uh, but it it actually, the, the repercussions have served to encourage me okay. to continue having fierce conversations because the repercussions are usually that a relationship ends. You know, it's so mm-hmm. often that that's what it is. Or that um, that I stop myself because I was headed in a direction that, probably wasn't going to be the right direction for me long term. And um, so, you know, I mean, I, one of the, one of the toughest conversations I ever had, the fiercest was, you know, with my then husband and, and the repercussions were that it became really clear that he wanted some, a life entirely different than Mm -hmm. the life that I wanted. And it was sad. It was Mm -hmm. hard to end that because I mean I had great dreams for what it was going to be like but he had entirely different dreams. Mm-hmm. So there are repercussions but look you have to you have to be willing to pay the price. I mean and and sometimes you you might be the most skilled person in the world at fierce conversations and it could still blow up the other person, you know, just blows up all over you and tells you what he or yeah. she thinks of you and the I was horse just, you rode in on and all that. <laughs> I yeah. was just telling Jesse about that yeah. before you came that I've had I've had someone say yeah. to me, Margaret, I thought you were supposed to be good at these fierce conversations. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> but they hadn't read the book or anything. Yeah, so there's a lack of communication yeah. there. And, yeah. uh, but it, it's so interesting. Yeah. So, so it's not always going to go the way you would want it to go. But um, I, I read somewhere, I can't remember where, the person said, I don't know the secret of – Success, but I sure know the secret of a failure. Secret <laughs> of failure. Try to please everyone. Yeah. And boy, one. that's true. So you're not going to please everyone. Yeah. And 
that's just the way, and they're not going to please you. And and depending on how important the issue is, it's either well, we let's find a way to continue together, no understanding this, or let's not. So mm-hmm. there, you know, there can be. It's it's not all about butterflies, butterflies and, and roses. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. rainbows. Yeah. Okay. And then from Kaylin Hubbard, um, he is down in Oklahoma, I think it is. He says, in building an empire, what's the number one conversation you want your people to be comfortable having with their superiors? Well, A, I don't think, uh, I would never, this is not a criticism of him, but mm-hmm. I don't think in terms of superiors. Mm-hmm. Um, I it, At Fierce, I feel that we are all equal mm-hmm. and that we talk with one another as equals. And... Um, I almost, I almost let go a, a, a key executive who was being very different with support staff than he was being with me. And I had talked with him several times, and I finally said to him, you don't understand, this is a, you could lose your job if you can't change this. So just that as an aside. Mm-hmm. But um, I, the most important question would be, or the most important conversation would be for the the employee to be thinking, what is, I mean, given, every, it's, it's like goes back to mineral rights, given everything that I'm learning, everything I'm challenged with, everything I'm accomplishing, um, the places where I'm failing, given all that, what is the most important thing I would love to talk with my, my boss about? And it, it would be that. So okay. it's going to be something different for each person on any given day. Mm -hmm. But it's like, what is the most important thing rather than just, how's it going? It's going good. How about you? Yeah, fine. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I can see where people want to focus on the suddenly Mm -hmm. versus the Mm -hmm. gradually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so my response to it would be is that if you have a thousand conversations that move your business forward 1%, like Mm -hmm. you'd have a a totally different business, right? So, you know, the, the whole idea of, um, fierce conversations began with Hemingway's quote in um, The Sun Also Rises when a character asks somebody, how'd you go bankrupt? And he says, gradually, then suddenly. Uh, and it occurred to me, I mean, I had a huge epiphany that our careers and our relationships and our our lives are succeeding or failing gradually, then suddenly, one conversation at a time. But sometimes we are failing so slowly, hmm. we think we're succeeding. Yeah. And so gradually, 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 for one missing conversation, we, we could find ourselves in a place where we had no idea where we were going, and we certainly didn't want to go there. So it is about um, being awake, staying awake um, well, in our lives. And a uh, big concept, many of the concepts in the book about you know, having deep relationships with people. And Mm -hmm. so if you um, are meeting with your admin, you know, having a conversation on a regular basis to deepen that relationship, Mm -hmm. that's the most important conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember years ago, gosh, his name just went right out of my head. He wrote a book called The The, um, Experience Economy. Joseph Pine, Mm -hmm. great book. And he was saying what customers want is not just a decent product, um, or service, and everybody can get that. They want to enjoy the experience of yeah. using it. I believe that we are moving into the, and have moved into the um, connection economy. People want connection. They want mm-hmm. deep connection. They don't want shallow, superficial water mm-hmm. skiing. They want to put on that scuba gear and go deeper into the relationship and really know and trust that we are together in this. And we may not agree on every single thing, uh, but we are together, and we care about one another, and that just does not happen with the typical "How are you? I'm fine" mm-hmm. conversation. Mm-hmm. It takes something more than that, and I think, uh, I mean, that's fierce conversations is really all about that. How to get into the deeper, the deeper waters where there's beauty and magic and stuff we never even could know was there Mm -hmm. that we're never going to experience as long as we're just wading in the shallows Mm -hmm. okay susan scott i feel like we should uh, (laughs) honor your time i just thank you so much for honoring us and coming here today um 
despite the traffic. I'm and so everything. glad to see you too. <laughs> I missed you. It's wonderful to see oh, you. We miss you too. And I yeah. want to uh, encourage people. Out, let's uh, do something off the cuff. If you leave a review of this episode mm-hmm. and you reference this episode specifically in yeah. Fierce Conversations, uh, we will have a drawing and we'll send somebody. Uh, perhaps even a signed copy yeah, of Fierce Conversations. Absolutely. I can make that happen. Yeah. Gonna, <laughs> we're going to have a Yes, you can. It'll be a signed copy of Fierce <laughs> Conversations by Susan Scott. And I promise you, if you're looking for an opportunity uh, to start a revolution in your life, then mm-hmm. I recommend this book specifically. Mm-hmm. And we love you, Susan. Thank yeah. you for being here. You're so welcome. Well, I love you, too. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good thing we've got here. Yeah. Thanks for listening, guys.